quasars are bright. But just saying that doesn't really communicate like how insanely bright they are. Let's compare it to something like, I don't know, a supernova. Yeah, you know, a supernova. When a massive star dies, a supernova is bright enough that it can outshine an entire galaxy for a few weeks. Which, that is pretty impressive. One star pff, blowing up can outshine hundreds of millions of stars in its host galaxy. More luminosity, more brightness, more raw brightness from that one exploding star. And that will last for a few weeks until it all cools off and you're left with the white dwarf or the neutron star or the black hole or whatever you're left with. A quasar. One of these active black holes where material is falling into a black hole, heating up and emitting radiation as it gets compressed in this very tiny volume. A quasar can outshine a thousand galaxies, 10,000 galaxies, maybe even in some cases, a hundred thousand galaxies, not for a week, not for a year, for millions of years. These are by far the most energetic engines in the universe. There isn't much that can out, outpower a quasar. I guess you have to go up to like merging galaxies themselves. That collision releases more energy. Okay. But beneath that, there's nothing. Quasars are the most powerful engines. When these things shine, we literally see them from across the universe and they're persistent. They're not just like a flash, like a supernova. These things go on for eons. So quasars are incredibly powerful, but we detect even more powerful kinds of quasars. These are called, appropriately enough, the blazars. What an amazing name. That's one of my favorite things in astronomy is the crazy names that previous generations of astronomers have come up with to, to describe everything we see in the night sky. And in this case, a blazar is an incredibly powerful quasar. Now what's going on here? Here's how we think Blazar is happening. They're relatively rare, relatively rare. Only a small fraction of quasars look like blazars. And there's some pretty cool physics going into the generation of a blazar. So your typical quasar picture is you have a supermassive black hole, hundreds of millions of times more massive than the sun, sometimes billions or tens of billions of times more massive than the sun. Material falls in, gas and dust. There's a big feeding event of the black hole. It is active, it is hungry, and it is consuming. All that material compresses into that black hole, heats up, emits a lot of light. Boom, quasar. But as that material falls in, it will start to spin. If it has just a little bit of spin, which it will just by random chance, then as it compresses, it will spin even more from conservation of angular momentum. And as it does, it will flatten into the shape of a pancake. And this accretion disk is one of the most common structures we see in the universe. Nature doesn't make a lot of shapes. Nature makes blobs, nature makes balls, and nature makes disks. Uh, and so that's our choice here. If you're spinning and you're compressing, you're gonna make a disk, you're gonna get an accretion disk around this black hole. Now this material falling into the black hole is spinning incredibly rapidly. I mean, just fast, all right? And it's a plasma. It's hot enough that atoms have disassociated, so there's electrons swimming freely and positively charged nuclei swimming freely, and they're all swirling around like crazy together as they fall into the black hole. But a plasma spinning fast, uh, that's gonna generate some electric currents, right? These charges spinning around. You get electric currents. Those are gonna change with time. You're gonna get a magnetic field. You're going to get an incredibly strong magnetic field in this accretion disk. In fact, some dynamo mechanisms will operate to amplify a magnetic field to be way stronger than you might expect. Same exact physical processes that generate the Earth's magnetic field or the Sun's magnetic field create magnetic fields in these accretion disks. Now, magnetic fields can do some pretty crazy and unexpected things. They can 
loop and swirl around the black hole. And because of the complex interactions between the magnetic field and the gas and the accretion disk itself, the magnetic fields can take some material, they can wrap themselves around the black hole without going in and then form little jets, little jets on the axis of rotation. And some of the material that's falling into the black hole, some will go most, in fact, will go into the black hole and be gone forever, but some will get caught up in these strong magnetic field lines and they'll follow it. They'll follow it. They'll wrap around the black hole, get funneled to the poles and then shot out as a jet from both axes like this. Now we see this situation all the time. We see much weaker versions in the sun itself. We see much weaker versions when there's uh, a small black hole or even a neutron star or a white dwarf that's accreting material. These jets are pretty, pretty common phenomenon actually. Now these jets of material are traveling at close to the speed of light. So they're blasting out of there. These jets travel for tens of thousands of light years. They, they carry this material from this tiny little accretion disk that's no bigger than say a solar system. The material gets ejected outside of the host galaxy itself, stretch for tens of thousands of light years, and eventually dissipate in the intracluster medium, in the diffuse cloud of gas and dust that all galaxies are embedded in inside of a cluster. These jets have magnetic fields wrapped around them that keep them collimated as jets for these incredibly long lifetimes. And they're incredibly powerful. And as you can imagine, if you're looking at various active galaxies, various active quasars, sometimes you're going to see the jets say go up and down, some at times at an angle, sometimes like this, sometimes like that, and sometimes straight at you. Just by random chance, sometimes these jets are going to be pointed right in our faces. And when that happens, not only is there a blast of radiation coming at us? But because this gas is traveling so quickly, close to the speed of light, there's some relativistic effects, an effect called relativistic beaming. And that's because when something's traveling very close to the speed of light and it's emitting radiation, it's not going to emit radiation equally in all directions. It, most of the radiation is going to be concentrated into a forward shaped cone in front of the object in the direction of travel. This is a purely relativistic effect. It pops out of special relativity. And when a blazar is pointed at us, we get the full blast of that. So not only do we get the blast of radiation, but this relativistic effect called beaming collects any other radiation that would have totally missed us, gone off in some random direction in space, gets focused on us. So we get like a double blast. Plus, because this cloud of, of jet material is traveling close to the speed of light, it's going to redshift up the radiation to higher and higher frequencies. So these blazars come out blazing. They come out much, more intense than you might expect. And they become some of the brightest sources in the universe. The brightest, for sure, the brightest distant sources in the universe by a ridiculous margin. These things, quasars themselves, are already brighter than entire galaxies by like a factor of a thousand. These things are like a thousand times brighter than that. Incredibly powerful, incredibly dynamic. Of course, like I said, not all quasars light up as blazars. It has to be the right orientation. And not every active galaxy, not every galaxy that's feeding material into its supermassive black hole even lights up as a quasar. We think, we're pretty sure that no matter the kind of galaxy, whether it has a jet or no jet, whether it's loud and radio, quiet and radio, whether it's giving off x-rays or not x-rays, or whether it's highly variable, not highly variable, is the same kind of system 
it's a feeding black hole, but depending on the particular physical scenario and depending on how we're looking at it, whether we're looking at stuff edge on or face on or oblique at a little angle, that this gives us a variety of objects that have all sorts of cool names like Quasar and Blazar, but also Liner and Seifert. And I can't even think of all the others. There's like a dozen of them. It's crazy. And we think it's all a common scenario, an active galactic nuclei. A galactic nucleus, a supermassive black hole in the heart of a galaxy that is feeding and being active and that process of feeding generates a ridiculous amount of radiation. So that's what we think. So active galactic nuclei are the broadest category. Quasars are a kind of active galactic nucleus and then blazars are a kind of quasar. So that's where they fit. There's all sorts of other kinds of active galaxies that I'd love to talk to, so feel free to. There's all sorts of other kinds of feeding active galaxies that I'd love to talk about, so feel free to ask the question whenever you want. And thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this, please hit the like button and subscribe. Go to patreon.com slash pnsutter so I can keep making these video videos possible and keep telling you about all the crazy stuff that's happening in our universe. I can't believe it either, but we live here.